Well, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you're watching this video. We're so grateful that you're choosing to spend some time in your week worshiping God with us here at the Brighton United Methodist Church. We want to welcome you to this edition of our virtual worship for January the 10th. This is the day we celebrate and commemorate the baptism of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by John at the Jordan. We want to welcome you and we want to begin by just inviting you to continue connecting with us here at the church. You can do that in a couple of ways. First of all, you can find us uh, on uh, our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com. There you can find all the information about our ministries, links to uh, all kinds of things that might be helpful to you. Uh, find the ways that you can remain connected with us. Plug in and be a part of our ministries here at the church. We also want to invite you to find us over on Facebook. Uh, when you find the church's Facebook page, you can look under events and get all of the information about upcoming events in our virtual Bible study. You can tune in to our midday prayer break every weekday at noon and join us for some time in prayer. You can get all of the information and the inspiration that you'll need to get through your week together with us. We also want to uh, make you aware that as uh, the COVID situation has been uh, changing and evolving here in Adams County, where our church is located here in Colorado, we are going to be uh, renewing our efforts to meet in person starting next Sunday. Now that doesn't mean that you won't be able to count on these virtual worships. We're gonna continue producing the virtual worship just as long as it's needed. And uh, so if you don't feel comfortable joining us or you can't, uh, I want to invite you to uh, take part in virtual worship. Uh, but if you'd like to join us in person and you're feeling well, uh, you can grab your mask and grab your Bible and uh, join us. We're going to be uh, signing up once again for uh, reserving your spot to be a part of our in-person worship. And we want to encourage you as you feel comfortable and are able to join us for that starting next week. Now, as we enter into the atmosphere of worship today, we are invited there by the words of Psalm 29. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of of God thunders the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all say, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Even as we... Remember the baptism of Jesus, the beginning of his public ministry, the revealing, continual revealing of his might and his purpose, ushering in his kingdom. We gather here in this way, in this time, in this place, to remember our baptisms. And we gather to proclaim as the people of God, glory glory. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we, your people, gather here in worship on this day to proclaim your glory, to give you the honor and the glory for our lives. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you even as we humble ourselves before you for our opportunity, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to connect with you. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit afresh on us as we gather to worship you this day. 
Lord, come into our hearts that they might be strangely warmed. Come into our minds that we might be truly inspired. Lord, take hold of our lives and transform us to your glory, making us sons and daughters, co-heirs with your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, do it now, and do it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. If you would like to bring for the mystery box in the coming weeks, I've got some openings coming up and I would love for you to just send me a picture. All you have to do is look around your house and find something that you would like to submit. Take a picture of it and email it to me at revkershaw at gmail.com and then watch upcoming uh, editions of our virtual worship and see when your mystery box entry makes it into the worship service, okay? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for your protective shell around us and for the warm and soft and wonderful love that you give us. Lord, we thank you that you are both the protector and the lover of our soul. Lord, we thank you so much for the love that you share with us each and every day, but especially the love you share through these beautiful children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We begin our time of prayer today with a prayer of confession. This is when we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives to reveal for us any way in which we fall short of God's glory. When the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and reveals it, we respond through confession. But confession isn't enough. We must then repent and turn from our sins, embracing afresh the new life, the forgiveness of God in Christ. It is then we discover the miracle of the gospel, that God is more ready, willing, and able to forgive our sins than we ever are to confess or repent for them. We will gather today in a general prayer of confession, followed by a moment of silent prayer, giving you a chance to lift up your personal confessions to the Lord. Then we will come back together again, embracing the forgiveness of God afresh. Let us pray. O God, our Father, we have sinned against you and are not worthy to be called your children. We have forsaken your way and walked in the light of our own eyes. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not had in us the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. We have been conformed to this world which passes away. We have not endured as seeing him who is invisible. Forgive us, we ask you, most merciful Father, and renew us again in the strength of your grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, our God is mighty to save and faithful to forgive. So may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins through Jesus Christ our Lord, and strengthen us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit all our days. Amen. 
And now, friends, having freshly embraced the forgiveness of God, having confessed our sins, we now gather our hearts and minds and voices together in declaring our faith in the words of the ancient Apostles' Creed. Let us join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we continue in prayer in the midst of our worship today, we want to invite you, if you have a joy or a concern that we, your church family, can be lifting up in prayer, we want you to send that to us uh, using our prayer email address at brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. When you send in your prayer requests there, they come directly to me. And when they do, I lift them up in prayer and then I send them along to our prayer warriors that we might keep you in prayer throughout this week. And if you would like to join us as a part of our prayer warrior team, it's as simple as going to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com. And uh, you can scroll down a little bit and find the link to MailChimp where you can enter your email address and begin receiving those email updates with all of the prayer requests that come into our congregation. However you do it. Make sure to lift up your joy and your concern. Give us the privilege of praying with you and praying for you. Together, we will contend for your breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, like many of you, I was disturbed this week by images and videos of uh, protesters and rioters storming our nation's capital the unrest that has continued throughout this pandemic season. And so I want to invite you to join me in praying for our nation and for our world. Let us pray. Creating and sustaining God. We find ourselves coming to you in prayer, escaping from the chaos of our world into the comfort of worshiping you. And Lord, we humble ourselves before you in prayer, knowing that beyond our homes, beyond our church, there are storms brewing. There is chaos unfolding. It is fueled by fear and anxiety. It is fueled by suspicion and accusation. It is fueled by selfishness and hatred. Lord, we are your church. And we hear your call. Your call to reveal the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Lord, we hear your call to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, to be the leaven infusing this world with your glory. But it is so hard, Lord. The task seems impossible. The struggle seems insurmountable. But Lord, we don't want to be the disciples in the boat staring at the storm. For we want to follow you. The one whose voice the storm obeys. Lord, we long to be your sons and your daughters on fire with your Holy Spirit, bringing about your kingdom on this earth. Lord, we humble ourselves before you, declaring on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we come before you with our many concerns. We come before you with the joys of each new day. And we lay our prayers before you, knowing that you not only hear, but that you respond according to your perfect will. Lord, we call upon you to respond, to grow peace on this earth, and to do it through us, empowered by your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, the one who taught us how to live, and the one who shows us how to love, and the one who brings us together in prayer as we now join in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
there hasn't been one there's a new kid in town and he's lying in a manger down the road there's a new kid in town but he's just another baby I suppose heaven be reading scripture today from the New Revised Standard Version. We have two scripture readings today, and I'm going to start with Acts 19, 1 through 7. This is Paul in Ephesus. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Now let's go back to Mark, where we're going to read Mark 1, 4 through 11, the baptism of Jesus. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the throng of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, we're into a new year, and rather than beginning a new series, uh, we're going to begin uh, looking at the official lectionary assigned readings for each week and just taking them as they come, taking God's Word at its face and, and mining it for the truth the Holy Spirit has for us each and every week. And so I want to invite you into this journey with me as we uh, dedicate ourselves to, to reading through the, the uh, year B of the lectionary. And we begin 
with this pair, this tandem of passages from Acts and from Mark. All together, there were about 12 of them. All together, there were about 12 of them. That's how the passage from Acts concludes today in verse 7, right? All together, there were about 12. 12 of them. One of the things about the book of Acts that's so fascinating to me is that they're not obsessed with numbers, but they're uh, quick to give us these signposts, these, these, uh, these numbers of disciples as they become added to and enhancing the uh, growing body of Christ uh, in this, uh, in this new movement, the way, as it was called. Right way back in chapter one, of the book of Acts. We are told that as the disciples gather after Jesus has been uh, raised into heaven, the ascension, sitting at the right hand of the Father, raised into the clouds, they return to Jerusalem and they gather to to, uh, cast lots and replace Judas. And we get this tidbit that there are about 120 of the disciples at that point. Then we move on to chapter 2, which, of course, if you're you're familiar with Acts, is the, the, the falling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Tongues as of fire uh, divide and fall upon the disciples, and they speak in languages. And Peter stands and gives that first Holy Spirit-inspired sermon. And we get another signpost telling us that about 3,000 hearers of Peter's first sermon, they commit their lives to Christ. Um, A couple of chapters later, in chapter 4, Peter is again preaching after the healing of of the the uh, the lame man at the temple. And it tells us that about 5,000 come to know Christ. So the numbers are getting bigger. Well, then we get to chapter 19, and we have this little uh, little bitty story here about Paul's uh, adventure to Ephesus. And when he gets to Ephesus, he finds this collection of disciples. And at the end of this passage, it tells us another signpost. It says, All together, there were about 12 of them. We began with 120, and then we added 3,000, and then we added 5,000 more, and and now we have this little story punctuated with a tenth of where they started. Uh, My, how the mighty have fallen, it would seem, right? We have so few uh, disciples here. Why would this story be included? We get to chapter 19, and Paul encounters these disciples at Ephesus, and and Luke reports that there are about 12 of them. Why is it important? Well, it is true that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. The difference in numbers here says to me that this story is significant for a different reason. It's significant for a different reason. First of all, it begins by using the same word to describe these about 12 as it does to describe the very first disciples, the core 12 that become the apostles. It uses that same Greek word to describe them when it says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the region, uh, the interior region, and came to Ephesus where he found some disciples. That's the same word. It's the same word having all the same meanings that's used to describe Peter and James and John and the Twelve and even Paul himself. This word disciples is the same word that's used. And so we're not talking about a different kind. We're not talking about this fringe movement. We're talking about disciples. We're talking about the same thing. And Paul asks, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you became believers, he asks. Now, it's important for us to to note that this is a major theme in the book of Acts, this this receiving the Holy Spirit, because every point from chapter 2 on, whenever people came to believe, whenever they came to faith in Christ and were baptized in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That was the mark. That was the thing. That was needed, and this isn't the only place in the book of Acts where uh, where disciples, people who are trying to follow Jesus without the Holy Spirit, are confronted with that fact, and then brought the Holy Spirit through the ministry of the apostles. Peter has a similar situation, and so this theme of the Holy Spirit falling—that's the sign that the early church used 
to identify those who were truly following Christ, who were a part of the way. And so it's very natural for Paul when he finds these, this pocket of about 12 disciples at Ephesus. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? Now their answer is surprising because they reply, no, we didn't even know there was a thing as the Holy Spirit. Right? We didn't, we didn't even know that this was a thing. How could they not have known? Who knows? But it wasn't even known to them. No. So he then asks about their baptism. He, he goes a step further. Okay, so you haven't received the Holy Spirit. So what kind of baptism were you brought into the faith under? And, and they respond to him. They respond to him. We into the baptism of John, right? They answered into John's baptism. Into John's baptism they were, they were baptized. Well, you see, there's the problem right there. That takes us to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark outlines for us beautifully at the, in the opening verses of this, of this briefest of Gospels, the centerpiece of year B in the lectionary. This Gospel of Mark outlines for us exactly what they meant by the baptism of John. And we hear it. In the opening of our verses today, John in verse, chapter 1, verse 4, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of what? Of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That sounds like a good plan, right? Repentance for the forgiveness of sin. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. It's a baptism of repentance. And repentance is good, right? Repentance is that we've talked about it in the prayer break. We've introduced it and, and incorporated it into our weekly worship. It is, that, it is that sense of turning from our sin and re-embracing the forgiveness of God in Christ, right? It is that allowing the Holy Spirit into our lives to, to comb through and to reveal what needs to go. Repentance is our response to that. And John comes into the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Repent of your sin. Repent of your sin, right? But John doesn't leave it there. John doesn't leave it there. The people of Judea and Jerusalem were all coming out to be baptized by John in the Jordan River and confess their sins. Now, John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He was a little odd dresser, right? And he ate locusts and wild honey. He had sort of a strange diet, but we can let that go. He proclaimed... This is important. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. And I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandal. You and I have heard that before. He says, I'm coming with a baptism of repentance, but there's one who's coming after me. I'm making the way for the Lord. That was a strong theme in our Advent readings, right? I'm making the way for someone greater than I, and I'm not worthy to untie his sandal. I have baptized you with water, John says, but he, the one who comes after me, the one who's greater than I am, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John says, one who is more important than I is coming. Repent and prepare for that next, that greater coming, that greater baptism in the Holy Spirit. Repentance is important. Don't, don't hear me wrong. Repentance is important. It's why we emphasize it in the prayer break. It's why we emphasize it in our prayer time here in our worship. Repentance is important, but it is not ultimate. Repentance is a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. Repentance is important, but it is not ultimate. John proclaims his baptism of repentance, and then Jesus comes along, not to baptize, but to be baptized. Isn't that curious? He comes not to baptize, even though that's what John says he'll do, but to be baptized. The result, the result is a fascinating one. The result is an inspiring one as the result of Jesus' baptism as he emerges from the water is perhaps the only earthly manifestation of all three persons of the Holy Trinity in one place at one time in the history of humanity since the garden. 
right? Think about this. Think about this as we dip our toes into the story of the baptism, right? Just in verse 10, just as he was coming out of the water, this is Jesus, he, Jesus, saw the heavens torn apart, just like, just like our, our friendly prophet Isaiah talks about, the rending of the heavens. The heavens are torn apart, and the Spirit descends like a dove. So we already have the Son, that's Jesus, right? We have the Spirit descending like a dove, and the voice came from heaven, the voice of the Heavenly Father. You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. That's what the Father says. You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Notice that Jesus hasn't done anything but come to John. Mark is the briefest of our Gospels and the, and the most uh, succinct in describing Jesus' movements and Jesus' teachings. According to Mark, Jesus hasn't done a single thing. Mark hasn't even uttered a word about Jesus' birth other than it happened, right? In the beginning of the good this the, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it starts. And then it goes right into John the Baptist. The first mention of Jesus is when he comes to John to be baptized in the Jordan. He hasn't done a thing, and yet God has already claimed him as son named him beloved, and declared, I am well pleased. This business about being the son of God, the beloved, the one who pleases the father, in this appearance of the father, son, and Holy Spirit, all in one place, all at one time, at the baptism of Jesus, reminds me of another gospel's account and that is the opening words of John's gospel. That's right, the opening words of John's gospel come to mind. In chapter 1, John opens with that soaring. The, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And by the time we get to verse 10, by the time we get to verse 10, we hear this. He was in the world, this is the Word, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who receive him, that is Jesus, the Word, the Son of God made flesh, all of those who received him, who believe in his name, he gave power to become children of God. He gave power to become children of God. Children of God. What did the Father say, you are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Son comes that you and I might become empowered to become children of God. That power to become is the Holy Spirit that is promised in the Word of God and delivered at Pentecost and available to you and me, the sign of the moving of God in this world. Now that's pretty striking enough. But what does Paul have to say about being children of the Most High God? What does it mean to become a children of the God? We're empowered to be it by the Holy Spirit. How, what does that mean for our lives? What does that mean for our faith? What does that mean for the way we conduct ourselves? What does that mean for our identity? Well, Paul tells us in his letter to Rome in chapter 8, starting in verse 12, Paul, in this beautiful, soaring, awesome pinnacle of a chapter, chapter 8 of his awesome book to Rome, he says, So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But, but if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, that's the power of God, remember, to become children, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Do you hear that? For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, bearing witness with our spirits, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, 
heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Did you hear what, John, what Paul just said? Paul just said the spirit that empowers us to become children of God that John speaks about, the empowerment of the word made flesh, giving us the power to become children of God by the Holy Spirit, makes us not just children, but heirs, inheritors of Almighty God, co-heirs with Christ, the second person of the Trinity. This is what lies at the heart of Paul's question. Into what were you baptized? Paul wants to know, into what were you baptized? Because if you didn't receive the Holy Spirit, then you have yet to receive your inheritance as children of God, as heirs, co-heirs with Christ. He asks, into what were you baptized? Because it matters. John comes baptizing with water. But Jesus, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John's baptism leaves us recognizing the gap in our life. Lord, we have fallen short. While Jesus' baptism infuses us with the power of the Holy Spirit to become children of God, joint heirs with Christ. And this power not only bridges that gap that John's baptism reveals, but it transforms our very being. Transforms our very being. When Jesus emerges from the water of the Jordan and the Holy Trinity is revealed here on earth, the voice of God declares, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. With Jesus emerging from the tomb and ascending into heaven, the Holy Spirit is poured out on us, transforming us from sinful and fallen and selfish and broken wretches into sons and into daughters. By the power of Jesus' baptism with the Holy Spirit, you and I, you and I hear the still small voice of God saying, you, you are my beloved son. You are my daughter, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. So you see the story of these 12 or so reveals to us our choice. Will we remain stuck in our sin, hindered by the gap, recognizing we fall short with nothing we can do about it? Or will we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives that we might become God's beloved? The choice is ours. Are you ready to choose? Let's choose together. Amen. Well, are you ready for your homework? I hope you are. I hope you haven't slacked off on your homework in my absence. It's been a couple of weeks since we've assigned you any of those dangerous prayers. But today, we want you to begin with the Thirsty 30. Remember, we're about, we're about uh, grounding us in the practical. We're not about the theoretical here at the church. So we want you to put this into practice. How do we do this? How do we make this a part of your life this week? And that begins with that Thirsty 30. That's 10 minutes of Bible reading. 10 minutes of prayer, 10 minutes of worship. Keep it up, right? Maybe you've started a, a new year's resolution to stay up with the thirsty 30. Whatever you do, if, you, if you're not doing any of that, pick one this week and do it. 10 minutes each and every day this week. If you've been doing that uh, 30 for a while, uh, or maybe you've been getting up to that 30 once in a while, but you haven't been consistent, make a plan, get there, right? It's no better time like the new year to start. Now, if you've been doing 30 for a while, maybe you've been really consistent about that. Challenge yourself. Give a little bit more to God. You will never regret giving more of your day to the God who gives us each and every day. Now, here's what I want you to think about, though, as we do that Thirsty 30 this week. I want you to think, have I been baptized? Most people in the Methodist 
church in the Methodist tradition have been baptized, it may be as infants, and that's wonderful. But have you been baptized? And if you haven't, realize that the Word of God, read the book of Acts, the Word of God knows nothing of an unbaptized follower of Jesus. And so if you haven't been baptized, maybe you've been following Jesus for a while, it's time to make that public declaration. If you would like to be baptized, you know how to find me. Reach out to me and we'll, we'll make that happen. Somehow, some way, we'll make that happen. Masks, super soaker squirt guns, we'll get a hose out in front of the church. Whatever it takes, we will get you baptized, okay? Now, if you have been baptized, if you're one of the many who has been baptized before, I want you to remember your baptism. Maybe you were an infant. Maybe all you have is a, a dusty old photograph. That's all I have of your baptism. Talk to anybody you know who might have been there. Uh, remember your baptism. Grab some water. You're not going to rebaptize yourself, but remember your baptism. Think about the baptism of John and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit from Jesus Christ? Remember it, okay? Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come before your awesome presence and your mighty power to humble ourselves. Lord, we, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come into our lives and transform us from head to toe, from body to soul to mind, Lord, to spirit, that you would take hold of our lives and by the power of your Holy Spirit transform us. Set us ablaze, O Lord, that we might Share your gospel and spread your light to all we know. In Jesus' mighty and powerful and precious name, amen. As we hear of the ancient stories of God's original apostles bringing the good news of Jesus Christ into the world, we are aware that we as the church have a role to play in continuing that ministry up to this very day. We are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to the ends of the earth. Our work is not done. And so we invite you to contribute to our ministries. You know, God has been so generous with us, even in the midst of pandemic, even in the midst of all of the strife that we face in this world, in this time, God's generosity and abundance is overwhelming. God calls upon us to give generously, not because God has need of our riches, but because God knows that we have need to cultivate generosity in our hearts and to share as good stewards all that God has entrusted into our care. It is in that spirit that we invite you to contribute to the ministries of our church. If you would like to contribute to this vital ministry, spreading scriptural holiness across the land, we can do that in a number of ways. First of all, you can mail us your donation. We do, in fact, get the mail. You can log on to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com forward slash donate, and you can uh, enter your donation there. Or you can set it up with your financial institution to send us your contribution automatically. However you help, we want to thank you for your generosity, and we want to encourage your continued support of our ministries. Now, as we come into a new year, if you find yourself in financial need, maybe you've lost a job, maybe you've had your hours cut, maybe something has just come up in your life and it is putting a, a burden of stress and strain on you and your family, we want to be here to help you. So we have an emergency assistance fund. If you have a need, reach out to us through our prayer email address at brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. When you do, we will evaluate what we can do to help, and we will offer whatever help we can. Don't let shame or pride get in the way of your seeking the help that you need. Your church family wants to be there for you. And now, friends, may we open our hearts to God 
and give generously to the Lord. Gracious and loving God, you have entrusted us with the care of all that we have. Lord, we steward it into helping sustain the ministries of this church to the glory of you, our Father in heaven. Lord, we pray that you would bless these, our gifts, that they would become the fruit that feeds the people of this community. Bless it that we might spread your light that scriptural holiness might go out from this place. Now and forevermore we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. from this time of worship to the everyday, ordinary time of our lives, may you go. May you go transformed into the beloved of God. Claim your place as sons and daughters of the Most High. And go proclaiming that good news to all you meet. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.